Well, something has been puzzling me for many years. Why is it that some children raised in dedicated Christian families end up either walking away from Christian faith or practicing it only half-heartedly? I'm sure there are a number of reasons for this phenomenon, but one of these reasons is simply that people have free will. For example, a child can be raised in a completely godless family, but reverse their upbringing by choosing to follow Christ. I've seen examples of that. And from the Bible's perspective, this is a positive exercise of free will. And in the same way, another child might be raised in a very sincere and consistent Christian home, but choose to reject Jesus. Simple freedom of choice, I've seen that too, unfortunately. Another reason that kids from Christian families walk away or just cool off in their faith is that they may have suffered abuse by someone in Christian circles. Some church member or maybe a Christian leader shamed them or abused them, hurt them, disappointed them in some way. I'm sure there are also other explanations for why this phenomenon happens. But I want to follow up on another video I made recently about those who walk away from Christian faith because they've been hurt by other Christians. And I want to suggest an explanation from something written by Pastor Bruce Wilkinson. In his book, The Three Chairs, Experiencing Spiritual Breakthroughs, Wilkinson puts forth the principle of generational cooling off. In other words, there's a tendency for faith to diminish over a series of generations. An example of this phenomenon can be found by comparing Joshua chapter 24 with Judges chapter 2. In Joshua 24, 15 and following, Joshua offers Israel a clear choice as they prepare to take possession of the promised land. It says, If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods that your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the choice was clear, either serve the God who brought Israel out of Egyptian slavery and sustained them in the wilderness, or serve the occult gods of the people he drove out before them. What choice did the people of that generation make? Well, it says, The people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt, from the land of slavery, and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. And a few lines later in verse 31, it says, Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him, and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Okay, Joshua's generation had seen and personally experienced the wonders of God's deliverance, and they chose to follow him wholeheartedly. The next generation continued to live under the covenant, but without the fiery devotion of their parents. But now listen to Judges chapter 2, verses 10 and following, which tells us what happened to the next generation. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, that would be the generation following Joshua, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them up out of Egypt. Okay, here's my understanding of what happened. It's not that this third generation knew nothing about God or what he had done for Israel. They just didn't identify with any of it. And I'm sure that their parents and grandparents had told the stories of Israel's deliverance and related their personal experiences. But it did not really impact generation number three because they had no personal experience of or desire for God. Life was relatively good for them, compared to the previous generations anyway. Their grandparents had seen God at work as they conquered Jericho and the rest of the land. Further back, they had experienced God's provision in their wilderness wanderings. Eaten the manna, drunk water from the desert rock, seen Israel's enemies driven back in defeat. 
As children, the older ones may have even remembered the parting of the sea. Generation 2, that would be the children of Generation 1 and the parents of Generation 3, saw the after effects of God's working. They, they had been the pioneers in this land that God provided. They had rebuilt the conquered cities, recultivated the farmland, laid the foundations for Israelite culture going forward. They had worked out what family life would be like in this new land, how business would be conducted, how to deal with neighboring peoples, how to worship and celebrate festivals as a settled people. They had organized and begun to live out the details of the life under the covenant with God who had saved them and made them into his own nation. What about generation three? Well, they could simply sit back and enjoy the fruits of all that. They, they could coast. And they did just that as the period of the judges began. That's the 300 years or so after Joshua. They got involved with the worship of idols and everything that goes with that. Believe me, we're not talking about bowing before some cute, harmless little statue. Idol worship was, and forms of it still are today, dark, cruel, perverted, and downright evil. They abandoned the covenant, which is the solemn agreement that their forefathers made with God, and so had forfeited his blessing, his abundance, and his protection. The next three centuries were a roller coaster of faithlessness, foreign oppression, eventual repentance, deliverance, and then a repetition of the cycle many times over. It's a sad book, Judges. So Joshua and the elders represent the dedicated generation. They personally and passionately sought to know God. The children of Joshua and the elders represent the builder generation. They knew about God and his works, and they built society around that knowledge, but they lacked the deep passion. You can see them slacking off within just a decade or two after Joshua's death, according to one timeline of the period. The children of the builders represent the unbelieving generation. They did not know God. They abandoned the covenant and sought dark alternatives to true faith. Wilkinson calls these generations Chair One, Chair Two, and Chair Three. There are several other biblical examples of this generational cooling off. Abraham, a man of deep and almost reckless faith. His son Isaac, a man of faith but mainly the keeper of his parents' traditions. And Jacob, the wild child, a deceiver, schemer, and one who tolerated the use of idols in his family. But late in life, a man who wrestled with God and came to faith almost reluctantly. There's also the example of David, the fearless warrior who brought down a giant who dared to blaspheme Israel's God. He was a passionate musician and a composer of many psalms. His son Solomon was wise and a steady ruler of the great empire begun by his father, but whose faith was more philosophical than passionate. And then Rehoboam, the foolish, spoiled brat who squandered the empire of his forebears. What's my point? Is this generational cooling off inevitable, or can something be done to break the tendency? Well, my first thought is to go back to what I said in the beginning. People make choices. God designed it that way. And whether you believe in divine election or pure free will, it seems that, at least on a human level, choice is real. And there are no guarantees or surefire methods that would ensure that anyone could come to faith in Christ or stay a dedicated follower of Jesus. However, there are a few things that we can do to make that choice to follow the Lord clearer and more compelling. First, it's up to dedicated believers to set a consistent example. One of the reasons we hear over and over for why people walk away from faith or never consider it in the first place is the hypocrisy that clearly does exist among believers. I mean, it's undeniable. Which of us has never acted hypocritically? If we're honest, we're all guilty from time to time of inconsistency between what we say and how we act. Okay, so let's just admit it. Now that said, sometimes I don't know how to answer people who claim that their faith has cooled off because they expected some sort of perfection among believers and were disappointed when they didn't see it. The real world of faith is messy, with lots of ups and downs. Look at Abraham, look at David. Both of them had gaping inconsistencies in their faith journeys. 
Sorry, but that's just the way it is. Some of the walkaway's disillusionment is not our fault. But on the other hand, people should reasonably expect to see some sort of overall consistency in our faith. They should see progress. They should see authenticity and transparency. And when we sin and make mistakes, they should see us admit it and then show an honest effort to make amends and real changes in our behavior. I think that's the best kind of example, honestly. Honest, authentic, real-life faith. And if people follow our example, they will learn how to navigate the crazy path set out for all who follow Jesus. Next, we need to warn them about the struggles, trials, and disappointments that lie ahead of them. 2 Timothy 3.12 warns that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And of course, suffering in general comes to everyone regardless. And sometimes I think we promise too much. Life will be wonderful if you follow Jesus. God will bless you with good things and take away the bad things. Your problems will disappear. And while God does bless us when we trust in Him, and many of the things that captivated us before will be dealt with, in some ways the real testing has only begun. If Jesus suffered, so will we. A servant is not above his master. So we should prepare our children, grandchildren, friends, and new believers, wherever we might find them, that hurt, disappointment, and suffering in some proportion will always accompany God's blessings. Some of the suffering is just the way life is. God never promised that he would entirely erase suffering for his people, nor is he obligated to. In fact, James 1 teaches that suffering can be a means for perfecting our faith. Then again, some of the suffering will come from those who claim at least to follow Jesus. Some of those Christian people will just think they're doing the right thing. They don't really mean any harm. They just do silly, mean, or stupid things because they haven't achieved any real level of maturity. Others who hurt them will be using the name Christian for their own purposes. Let's remember that there are, after all, real wolves in sheep's clothing sometimes. Then we must hold the door open. What do I mean by that? Just that we hold out hope both for them and for ourselves. I've seen it. Some Christians ostracize those whose faith cools off or who just walk away. Now think about it. They walked away. So what do we do in response? Shut and bolt the door? Do we really want them back or not? Do we really expect that they will come running back into the arms of Jesus when life beats them up? How could they if we lock the door? I don't mean that we accept everything that they say or do. I don't mean that we have to agree with their values or lifestyles. Why should we? They make it clear that they don't accept many things about us. And it's not our place to compromise the values that come from God. They aren't ours to give away. But come on, do we want these family and friends back or not? And believe it or not, it is possible to really deeply love someone to want the best for them, to be willing to go the extra mile, and not compromise our own beliefs, values, and lifestyle. It's been called tough love. I prefer to call it realistic love. Make it clear that you will always love them even when there are disagreements, even when you must set boundaries. But also let them know that Jesus always answers when someone knocks on that door that leads back to Him. And when they do come back, Open your arms and help them. Finally, pray. Proverbs 22.6 says in the New King James Version, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I don't think this is an ironclad promise, but I do think it's a tried and true principle for how things often work. Look at Jacob. He spent most of his life away from the God of his father and grandfather, and life beat him up pretty badly. Then he had an encounter with God that broke him, actually literally lamed him. In the midst of that experience, he knew where to return. He knew the door was open and he went through it. It may not happen for those you care about. Free will is still there and some will never turn back to God's love. On the other hand, it may happen. Some will return to the faith they once were exposed to. 
Others, maybe not for many years. And maybe you won't live to see it. But pray. Pray, pray, pray. God can do what we cannot. Pray like someone's life depends on it. And indeed, someone's life does depend on it. I'm sorry. Many of us were kind of hoping that we could live a relatively easy, struggle-free Christian life. But that was never part of the gospel package. We were born for such a time as this. It was no mistake that God put you where you are with the people around you that you touch and who touch you. If we're going to win back the dear ones whose faith has cooled off, we must not expect that the pastor or the speaker or camp experience or musician or celebrity or anyone else will win them. Sure, some of these things can help. But ask yourself, why would God put you in their life if he didn't expect you to be part of their redemption? If we pray and get ourselves focused, who knows? We may just see revival in our personal lives, in our circles of relationships, and in our fractured world. Not in the distant future, but in our own times. This is Dr. Michael Bogart with Aspect Ministries. Thanks for listening.